something I need and to we do. are live. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Eric Larson. <laughs> hey. uh, first of all, thank you for accepting my invitation. It's a big honor to have you <laughs> on my podcast, a big uh, comic book legend. All right. You and Thanks well, what? Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, to all my guests, I, I start to ask him if they can introduce themselves or the people that don't don't know them. But if you don't feel comfortable, I can do it for you. <laughs> I know uh, I know everything. All right. <laughs> My, my name is Eric Larson. I write and draw a comic book for Image Comics called Savage Dragon. Prior to that, I was working on uh, some book called Spider-Man. I also what? worked on- Spider what? Sp <laughs> I know. What's that? I know. I don't some know. of these names, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I've heard of that somewhere. It's like the guy with the ears like that. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for a little while, so I've, I've hit most of the major food groups here. I, I At DC, I worked on the Doom Patrol. I've done some Teen Titans. I did some uh, one issue of Adventures of Superman. <laughs> one issue. One, just one. I, I Early on, I was doing, doing a lot of fill-in stuff because that, that's kind of the kind of work you get when you're just starting out. Is they just need uh, to toss a warm body, and when they, sure. you know, it's like the deadline has come and they need somebody, just who can we get? How can we get them to turn stuff around? And and I was that guy for a little while. I would just be Johnny on the spot, like we need a guy to do one issue with Thor. I right, right, right. need somebody to do one issue with the Hulk. Oh, right. You know, so it's like yeah, I got to I got to do it. You know, and and it's all about just kind of. Uh, and proving, the body share too. You know, proving yourself, showing you can you can make your deadlines yeah. and, and and what have you. And the Punisher. Oh, and the Punisher, yeah. Uh, What's a little a little rum that uh, was cool. Yeah, five I, I, issues. Five issues is nice. But I love the story with yeah. the ninjas and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, was... Doom Patrol. I did ten issues of that plus a special. Crossing over with the Suicide Squad, so yeah, that was pretty a little cool. bit of a run there. Um, I did the Outsiders. I did like two and a half issues of the Outsiders. Um, various books, though they just they would need somebody, and 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 I was like, uh, I'm your man. I mean, even yeah. even years later, uh, times came up where they needed somebody to do an issue of Spider Woman, and and one of the guys there was like, I know who could. Bat out an issue in a week, oh. give it to Eric Larson. I was like, all right. <laughs> no, that's it. amazing. So. <laughs> and you did also Captain America. I just did. Yeah, last year. I did yeah, a, that's a one that's shot great. Captain America the end. So that was, that was, uh, that was a challenge in a way. I didn't, I wasn't expecting the, the toughest part of that to be drawing his, his shield. <laughs> really? Yeah, such a pain in the ass. Why? It's it's uh, it's concentric shapes. It's like shapes that are filling fitting inside of another. Mm -hmm. And if you draw them all lopsided, then this shield looks just warped and broken. And oh, okay. so you're using all these ellipse templates and and uh, uh, circle templates and stuff like that to try and get the shapes just right. And then those don't quite line up so that the stripes are the equal distance apart from each other. And so oh. I ended up doing some tweaking in Photoshop after I'd drawn it to just make it look better than it did. But uh, it's more pain in the ass, like, for example, the suit of Spider-Man. Oh, no, for me, that, that's no, a lot of work. That's not like every time. Do no, the it, it's not though, because it becomes this kind of mindless uh, noodling on stuff, which is um, it's time consuming but not difficult. Ah, okay, I understand. It's like there's a lot of things where where uh, 
you're adding detail to stuff, like putting arm hair on a character. It's like, mm. yeah, it's a pain in the ass to go in and, and meticulously put in all those lines, but it's not difficult. Uh, Doing okay. something that's difficult would be, you know, drawing a, a drawing a car that's completely accurate, or drawing, a, mm. you know, something Get right that perspective. Uh, yeah, I mean, drawing a drawing a bicycle or drawing a a, a, a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, just like there's like okay. there's a lot of little pieces here that that need to be just right, or your your vehicle's gonna look screwed up, you know? Sure. Drawing a tire with uh, wire wheels, like, oh my God, I got to draw Rolls Royce. How do I draw this? <laughs> it drive me crazy. Those sorts of things, like, get, you know, getting the spokes right on a bicycle. It's like, oh, crap. Whereas doing a pattern, like, you know, the wiggly part of Dr. Strange's cape, it's mm. like, you know, it's kind of mindless. You just sit there and can, can noodle away at it. And it gets done. It may take a while, but yeah. it's it's not difficult. Mm. No, that's great. And I would love to hear how you start the, your your beginning. You you always wanted to be a to draw comic books. Mm -hmm. you, you were a comic book fan, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my my dad bought comics when he was a a little kid, so we grew up with his comic book collection. That was sort of part of our uh, our lives early on was just all these old comics from the golden age that he collected. And he collected up through the 50s. As he grew up, comics kind of grew up with him. And so uh, the last stuff towards the end of his buying comics was he started getting into the EC comics. So uh, Haunted uh. Fear and Vault of Horror and... and and the science fiction books, and, and he was getting all that stuff, and he loved it. And then eventually the uh, comics code came around and all the, and everything like that, and, and basically comics for grown-ups were just cut off at the knees, and they mm. had EC uh, went out of business in terms of making comic books. Mm. And at that point, uh, there was nothing for him anymore as a reader. So yeah. we stopped, stopped buying comic books, and I was, mm. was the no. Other. I think that that time was crazy. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so surreal to you know. So we uh, grew up with those, though. That was my yeah. sort of my introduction to comics was that, and mm. then I started buying comics myself when I was in like fourth, fifth grade. I started getting getting some comic books, and then um, we. I, I was always drawing. I was like one of those kids who would draw all the time. And uh, what what happened was at one point we moved from where we had lived up in Washington State down to Northern California. And we had just bought a plot of land. So it was basically the woods. And we just pulled into the woods. My parents had, had tossed together this crude hippie home and we were living out of this orange bus. And I just had nothing to do. So it's like, I just started drawing comics for myself on your standard type typewriting paper. And I would just uh, draw it on that, fold it in half and staple it up the side. And that would be my comics. And I would just do page after page after that. And I was creating my own characters and doing all these unofficial crossovers with Marvel and DC characters. They would just come <laughs> wandering into my stories because like, oh, I want to draw that guy. You, but, you, rem you, rem you remember some of those stories that you create? Or? I'm sure, because it was all, uh, it was Savage Dragon stuff. So I, I introduced the dragon when I was a real, real, real little kid. And he was, um, he was a ripoff of Batman. So if you can imagine, really? yeah, because, you know, instead of having the, the ears, he had yeah. just fin in the middle of his head, but oh. he, had a, he had, he had a mask just like Batman did. And he had, he wore a, a green cowl and he ah, was, so it was a costume. Yes. Yeah, so a a total costume. And he was, he was running around. Okay. And he had a utility belt and he drove speed racers car. Cause I thought that was cool. <laughs> You know, so it was like a lot of the trappings of Batman 
were in the real early Dragon comics. And then he, he got a partner who is named Star, and those guys would fight crime together. And, and just as time went on, I kept changing him, and I would oh. change things up. And eventually I was like, I was tired of drawing this cape and all this crap that went along with him. So I, and uh, he used to change too. He would change from William Johnson into the dragon. So he would, he would physically transform. Um, initially he was just like the same dude, but then as time went on, I kept drawing him beefier and beefier. And then he would change back into William. At that point it was sort of a, almost a Hulk Bruce Banner thing. And mm. he started developing his own personality. And then I did a story where I pulled the two apart and it's like, okay, now Dragon's one guy and William's another guy. And, and at that point, uh, Dragon was, Dra Dragon became kind of the guy he is now, uh, except, except his fin was super short. It wasn't, I didn't give him the, the, the tall fin until he was at uh, Image Comic. And on the time when you were Plito and created this, you, you show that stories to someone or? Um, not, a, not a lot. My, I, um, Towards the end, I self-published a fanzine called Graphic Fantasy, which was the first time I had sort of introduced the character to the wider world. I, I printed it and sold those comics through uh, through my a, my a local comic book store at the time, which was at that point I was living back up. So you Florida. were independent already. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nineteen <laughs> years old. My dad was teaching workshops, so he had a he had a printing press, and I was his I was his That's press great. man. The great. <laughs> and, uh, it was just a small tabletop offset press, and yeah. and so it's like I'm going to print my own comics. This will be cool. And so I had I had drawn up this dragon story, and me and a couple buddies uh, did our own comics, and and that was the start. That's uh, <laughs> that's fascinating. So, and at that point it was like, now I had something I could show people. It's like, look, I can, I can draw something. And a couple of people who had bought my comic through the mail ended up starting their own small comic book companies. Um, one of them is a guy named Gary Carlson. And I co-created a character with him named Vanguard. And, uh, and that was for his comic called Megaton. And that was sort of my first semi-pro stuff where I was actually getting paid a page rate and stuff like that. And, then, and, awesome. and so each you inspire, time, you inspire people. Yeah. Well, each, each job I would do, I would, I would get that next thing that I could show to the, to the, the editors and the next people just trying to work your way up the food chain, you know? Yeah. So it was a, a, a long process. So it was a 10 year process between the time mm -hmm. that I was self-publishing my own books to the time that I left to go uh, form Image Comics. So I started, start, broke into comics around age 19 and then Image started when I was around 29, so. So how, how you went to, I don't know, what, what was your big uh, break? You, you, you start to make your own comic, but then what was your, for a chance to, for example, work for Marvel or DC. Uh, with with Marvel, I had been I'd been showing them my work every time I would do anything. So when I was doing the Megaton stuff, I would send it in to the editor there. The editor in chief at that point was Jim Shooter, mm. and, uh, um, and then I I was eventually doing work for a company called AmeriComics or AC Comics. Um, and I did work there for a short period of time. And, and mostly it's just trying to figure stuff out and, and getting gradually a little bit better. Mm. So um, that, was, that was kind of the process. I, I just need to get there. I'm, I'm not getting there fast enough. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and it's so I uh, had been showing stuff to Shooter. I met him at a, a convention in Chicago. And uh, 
and so he was semi familiar with my semi familiar with my work. Um, and so he was looking through my portfolio of stuff that I brought, which I just brought everything. And he's like, so you're a professional now. And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And he said, how would you like to do something for Marvel fanfare? And I was like, I would love to do it. We should, we should plot it at the convention. He was a little taken back and it was like, all right. So we, uh, we talked through a story uh, at the comic book convention. Now, I th when I thought Marvel fanfare, I was thinking, oh, this is, this is like their, their, high, their prestige book. You know, this is <laughs> what I didn't know is Marvel fanfare was kind of code for how would you like to do an inventory job? Yeah. <laughs> basically, it like basically with like tryouts. With yeah, like yeah, yeah. So what they would do is they would get people to, to try out or do things. Mm. And then they would have these, these jobs that they would basically have sitting in a drawer so that if, uh, if a, uh, a creator missed a deadline on some other book, they could just slot it in there. And so <laughs> a lot of, a lot of these, these titles, um, they would have flat files and they would just have two or three stories that were just sitting in their flat files waiting for that magic moment when the creators blew it. Um, mm. Because, I mean, early on they would do is they would run reprints in there, but readers didn't don't like that. You know, it's like, oh, this is an old Fantastic Four story I've already read before. I don't, yeah. I don't want that. So instead of having those kinds of things, they started doing these inventory stories, which would be mm. new stories um, and of varying quality. Sometimes they would they would mm. get a drawer full of awesome stuff, and which was which was great. And then yeah. sometimes they would they would just have just the the lowest of the low <laughs> these things. And sometimes they would use those things as as like threats to creators who are working on books and be like. You know, if you don't make your deadline, we're going to run this terrible job in, in your book, and it's going to interrupt your it'll it'll interrupt your run. Everybody, all the creators wanted to have an uninterrupted run. That was kind of a, a point of pride is to be able to go. I worked on this book for thirteen years straight, and there was never a fill in. And blah blah blah. I, I got my act together. You know, really, <laughs> I I never. I never, what? Well, so, logic, but, so the uh, story I did was Hulk versus Thor, and it ended up running as an issue of Thor um, years later. But once I had done that, that, beca that became like awesome samples to send to editors because it's like, oh, it's got the Hulk and it's got Thor. Yeah. And both those guys. And they're kicking <laughs> the crap out of each other. And it, it just, it it lent itself to my strengths, which were which was just big action, um, mm. and so that particular job led to me doing the DNA agents over at Eclipse Comics. It led to me doing a string of villains over at DC, and eventually the Doom Patrol. Mm. And it led to me doing a villain issue of Spider Man fairly early on too. So was, how, your run on on Doom Patrol. What what do you think about the character you you like to to work uh, those characters because it was kind of unique. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to make any book that I'm working on uh, a fun book to work on. So if I'm on any book, I'm giving it my all, and I'll find the ways to make those characters fun to draw. So I I did the best I could with it. Um. I'm not. I'm not always super happy with my work, you know. Years after the fact, but at the time, that was that was peak. <laughs> that was as good as I could do. Yeah. No, but what I was um, trying to ask is because, well, I know you are a professional. So if they mm -hmm. ask you to draw any comic books, uh, you you were gonna do it. But of course, you, I'm sure you have some characters that kind of um, inspire you more? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I found ways to make that, that book a, a fun book. And, and they, they let me design new costumes for the characters. And I kind of visually reinterpreted some of the characters a little bit from what they had been. 
So I was given a great deal of freedom doing that book. And it, it was still a superhero book, so it did kind of play to stuff that I that I did fairly well. The bigger struggle was a book like uh, The Punisher, which was supposed to be more real world. And, yeah. you know, the struggle on that book was just, I can't draw guys knocking each other through walls. I can't, <laughs> can't have them be punching each other and have them fly 15 feet because... Real people don't yeah, do know. Yeah. And they, uh, the street was, uh, you know, so it's like all this stuff that, that, yeah. that my bigger than life tendencies, or all this stuff that's like, oh, this is off the table. You can't do it. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you remember when you work with uh, Mike Barron? Because I have it on my show. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember and, that. Still, especially, uh, especially he he told me that he he liked to make the things very real. So <laughs> I don't know if he he kind of he would draw all his plots. So yeah, they would you would get these things, and they were just like these these poorly drawn yeah comics. And and every now and then too, he would hit on something where you go, oh, that's actually a cool expression that you put on a character. I can't actually. I can't do that. I couldn't, I could, there was one time I was like, I'm sorry, man. I just couldn't nail that expression you did. And he was like, what are you talking about? It was terrible. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, I like that one for some reason. Um, yeah. But it was super helpful to have the stories broken down into panels. Like, you know, how many panels you got to deal with. Mm. You can see how to tell the story, even though, you end up changing things a lot because the angles that he would choose and, and just the shots were generally terrible, but the, you, it still helps him a lot to have it broken down like that. You sure. know, I mean, a lot, just I mean, the writers can do that in various ways. Some, some make it real easy for you and some just are, make it incredibly difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but that I was, like that was easier because it was broken down that way. Mm. No, that's great. So, <laughs> and you, when did you start to work for Spider-Man? Because I remember I, I have those issues. Is, uh, well, I did one issue super early on. I did issue 287, mm -hmm. which was really early on. I don't remember what, I don't, I'm not sure what year that was. I'd have to, to I don't know. I don't know the I don't know the years of all this stuff. It was in the 80s. Yeah, of course. It's a long time ago. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like what was the date on that? I'd have to I'd have no, to it doesn't matter. But else. you make one issue for Spider-Man. Yeah, I did then. one issue with Spider-Man and that was just a frantic fill in. I was doing uh Doom Patrol at the time and so it's like all right, can I can I do both of these at the same time? <laughs> and so I did. It's like I'm still making the other deadline. But it, but it was really a, a rush job. And then, uh, and then, uh, I, and then I, I mean, it was years later before I did any more. Um, it was uh, for, for Spider Man. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was years later. Todd McFarlane was on the book by the time yeah. I came back. And uh, he was working on a, a book called, a storyline called The Assassination Nation. I don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> and uh, they just needed somebody to do one issue and yeah. who could kind of keep it in Todd's style. And I, so it's like, all right, well, I'll, I'll do what I can here to try and fit in here as seamlessly as no, possible. I think it was a great transition. It was Just issue 324. And then, yeah. uh, and then I did 327 was my next Bill an issue, and then Todd came back for 328, and mm. then 329 on. I was off and running. I was I was on the book mm. fairly regularly up through 350. And I remember Venom. You you really kind of kind of changed a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was me trying to. You know, every time Todd would draw him. He would make him a little more monstrous than he was the last time. Mm. And, uh, and actually, me giving him a tongue was me 
kind of overreacting to something. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you see something and then, um, and, 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 and then you come back and, and later on somebody asks you about it and you're like, Oh yeah, it looked like this, but you know, but it wasn't something you, you bought or it was just something you saw and you're in your, in your brain, mm. your, your brain's telling you one thing that's not necessarily real. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you're yeah. feeling, feeling the blanks or, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I remember seeing this Hulk comic when I was a kid. I had no money in my pocket and I saw him on the cover and he was just like wailing. His hands were up or whatever. There's this big field of brown. And I was in my brain, I'm, I'm, my impression was, oh, Hulk fights a mountain. That's got to be the coolest comic <laughs> ever. And then um, it was it was months later before I actually saw the comic again. And it was like, no, he's he's actually standing on a boat, and that's like <laughs> old wooden boat, and and all the brown was just the brown of of the the the, the deck of his boat. Yeah. It's like, oh wow, I was totally wrong about that. Well, yeah, no. with this with the Spider Man thing, Todd had done a cover to Spider Man versus Venom, and Venom had his mouth open, and you could see his tongue. And, and it was just this little bit of red in my brain. My brain's telling me, oh, Todd's giving him a tongue now. I'm going to give him a cooler tongue. And so <laughs> for years, I was crediting Todd with, oh, no, Todd started doing the tongue thing on a cover. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until years later that I saw the cover again. I was like, oh, no, he just had his mouth open. You could see that he <laughs> owned a tongue, but he wasn't doing anything remotely weird with it he just yeah. it he just possessed a tongue <laughs> yeah. like, oh so i guess i gave him this big crazy tongue and i didn't even i didn't even realize that, that it was me i thought i was just topping todd from what he had just was <laughs> so like oh oh well <laughs> I, how was your run in on a spider-man how was it your, your run when you yeah. were drawing this this spider-man you You were having fun. You uh, you were kind of yeah. I mean, generally speaking, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was very limited, like what they led you, like the freedom that they they gave you. Um. Well, in terms of the way uh, David Nicolini would break a story down, is that he his plots were very much like this. He would go. Uh, page one, and he would describe a splash page. And then he would go pages two through 22, and he would just ramble and write his story. He didn't, break, he didn't break it down into pages at all. So there was no, um, so you didn't, you, you didn't know how many, you had to break it down yourself in terms of how long. Pages, uh, how so long. It was a plot too. So it wasn't, okay. it wasn't a full script. Um, and it was not, was well, not my Baron. <laughs> no, no, it's very, very different from, from my Baron and very different from, uh, full scripts, which a lot of writers do now is, is they will either do full scripts or they will do kind of a midway in between where you, where you'll, you'll break it down into pages at least yeah. and go, you know, page six, this happens, page seven, this happens. And, and break it down that way. Yeah. His, 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 th there wasn't any of that. Um, so so you that go, was more harder or more easier? Uh, it, it, it allowed, a, it was harder or easier kind of relative. Um, for me, <laughs> it, it allowed a certain amount of freedom to be able to uh, try a bunch of different things. Mm. And, and approach things in a, in a different way. It allowed me to pace the story in the way that I, that I was more comfortable with and that I think worked better. Because um, I get very particular about my approach to making... Like for example, he gave you the script to draw it. Uh -huh. Then you show it to him. I say, no, but that's not what I'm saying. It, it never happened. Uh, uh, like a little bit. There's a couple of things where I had to redraw things because I misinterpreted something or screwed it up. Sometimes I would call him and say, 
hey, can I can I do this? And he would be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible, you know. <laughs> um, but it 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 really does vary a lot from from one creator to another. Because I know when I was on uh, Doom Patrol. I just kind of did whatever the hell I wanted to. And in yeah. the case of that, um, I was really replotting some of those stories a, a lot, like mm. making it really different from what the, the writer had done. And I never heard word one about, uh, no, don't do that or whatever. I would just do whatever the hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, like, oh, fine. <laughs> go, go for it. Um, yeah. But no, uh, for me, that's, that's, the, that's the more interesting stuff when you give creators some freedom to to try new stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. But of course, when you are working for Spider-Man, that is like the almost the logo of Marvel. <laughs> it's like... On, on that, you, I, you know, I try to go, how do I make this this more exciting or bigger or more interesting or more visually cool or, or whatever. So it was always trying to, to bring something to it that made it more interesting than it, than it might be otherwise, you know, sure. that, was, that was always like, okay, if he's spinning webs, he's going to have a ton of webs. If, uh, you know, Mary Jane's going to be just as, as gorgeous as I'm capable of making her. You know the villains are going to be more villainous if you know and and a lot of it is thinking uh in terms of what's the best approach for this character or what's the most visually compelling or you know various things and mm -hmm. sometimes your your inclination is to go one way where you really you know if you stop and think about it it's like oh i probably should do something else um you know like my if my first thing with dr octopus would be boy he's kind of a goofy character he's got these <laughs> four extra arms and whatever he's always kind of this chunky guy in in tights i could make him even sloppier and in you know and then it and then it you know i thought about it and was like no i should i think it would do marvel better and the character better uh to make him more of a badass and less of a uh, less of a comic character you know mm. so it's like he's, he's going to serve the story better if i make him more intimidating mm. and so yeah. it's like rather than having him be a fat guy in tights i was like i'm gonna i'll put him in a suit and have him be uh less engaged with spider-man so i would have him be pouring himself a cup of coffee or, or uh, doing something else with his hands while he was fighting Spider-Man. So it was like, I don't even have to bother with you. I can, I can, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. need to be that involved. I'll be, I'll be reading the newspaper over here while I'm kicking your ass. You know? <laughs> and that yeah. made him more of a, a, a presence. Like, oh, mm. this guy's so much of a badass. He can be, off doing other stuff and not even have to multitasking. <laughs> yeah, so. no, that's that's great. So, <laughs> uh, so that's when you you meet uh, Todd McFarlane when you you start to grow. Uh, I had met Todd McFarlane at a comic book convention up in uh, up in Canada. He had. Uh, just gotten his first Marvel gig. He had just done an, an issue of um, Spitfire and the Troubleshooters. So it was, a, it was a new universe book and they needed a fill in. And he, and he said he could, uh, they asked him how long it took, would take him to do it. And he said, I could do it in three days. <laughs> what? <laughs> so he did this issue of, uh, uh, Spitfire in three days. He just pounded it out, and uh, and that got them to go. Oh, he can draw big guys. We need somebody to draw the Hulk. Let's get him to draw the Hulk. And so <laughs> that, 
was uh, that was just around the time that he was starting to make the move from DC over to Marvel. And uh, so he had a he had a hotel room. Me and a couple buddies had driven up there in this old uh, VW bug, and we had just we just wanted to go to the convention and meet whoever it is we met. And uh, I hit it off with Todd, and and Todd was just like, "Where are you guys staying, bud?" <laughs> I was like, oh, we're not staying anywhere. I don't even have a hotel. I'll you know, probably sleep in this dude's car or something. It's like, oh, let, let me go show you. Let's go see my hotel room, see if there's room enough to put you guys up. So he went over there, and it's like, oh, I got the two beds here. It's, it's just like he just he just put us up in his hotel room, and we just, you know, sh shot the shit. Man, that's a great impression of Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> and, um, so we hit it off real well, and and he, he was a good guy. And yeah. and what what was the subject when you were talking about uh, or just drinking some beers? He, he don't drink, or he drink? No, not that I. I but neither did I. I was. I was. I was so uh, you were. Just talking about comics and yeah, just talking about stuff. He's easy guy to talk with. I'm an easy guy to talk with. So it's just, you know, you hit it off with this subject. Or that. I mean, it's all trying to make comics and all trying to yeah. to get going and stuff like that. I think he and Wanda were just dating at that point. I don't think they were even married yet. Mm. So it's like you know, pretty pretty early on and. I did visit him at his, I want to say I visited him at his apartment at one point after that. He and Wanda were sharing an apartment. He was doing, a, at that point, he was doing Spider-Man. And that was right after I had done my fill-in. Mm. He enlisted my help to help him pencil in some of the uh characters that I that I had cre I had designed that he was now drawing. So in that assassination story, um, yeah. what had happened was I did my fill-in before he did the issue before the one I drew. So because oh. it's like it was such a mad scramble to get that done that it was like The, there was a character in there named Solo, who I ended, ah, up, Solo. Yeah. I ended up creating him on the on, in the issue that I drew, and so you created it Solo. Yeah. So, but but he appeared in the issue before that Todd was drawing, and so it was, it was like Todd had me over to his place, drawing penciling in all of his costume on the ver in the various spots where he had just kind of a vague figure. So I was in there penciling in all these solos, <laughs> and then he was going in there and, and inking them because it was like, oh, I don't know how this guy's costume goes here, but when he's turning around, what, what's, what's that look like? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, go like this and this and this. So there's a few different places in there where I can point to and go, oh yeah, that that figure I pencil I pencil that figure. <laughs> um, there's a Captain America figure that I I penciled him to. It's like, all right, here you go, buddy. <laughs> That's and there's a lot of just different stuff like that early on in in these image meetings and all this early image stuff where mm -hmm. we'll just be sitting there trading pages back and forth and it's like yeah you know, rob That's needed somebody to he was working on the first issue of young blood there's a page i inked in young blood number one there's a couple of pages i inked in uh issues of x-force Hmm. X-Force 2, I did three pages. And X-Force 3, I did two pages. It's like, they just, no. they just need somebody. Can you can you help out? It's like, sure. There was like a sense of uh, camaraderie? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Camaraderie or community or, or whatever. We would just hmm. be like, you know, hey, you know, especially during an image meeting where there would be yeah. a bunch of guys that are sitting there. We got to do business, but it's like, you got to keep those hands busy, you know? We got to yeah. So, so, so 
<laughs> you were drawing Spider-Man, uh, Tom McFarlane was drawing Spider-Man, uh, Rob Lither was doing Next Force. Uh, how the concept of image came to blow up or it, it was thought that say one day, hey guys, no, 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 it was rough. It was rough. It came from Rob. It was uh, me, uh, Rob Liefeld, and Jim Valentino went out to dinner with Dave Albrecht from Malibu Comics. Okay. And Rob had got in his brain. He he wanted to test the waters to see if um, if readers who are reading his stuff at Marvel would follow him over to do something else on something else. And he and he was talking to people at DC and he was talking to people at, at Malibu. Um, at one point he had pitched uh, DC on doing a Teen Titans spin-off book called Team Titans was his idea. Okay. Um, and if you look at the the initial young blood team that has bad rock in it and stuff like that yeah. you can look at it and go oh bad rock is is sort of a variation on a on a legion of superheroes character named block or <laughs> or somebody from the omega man there's another big beefy dude on the omega yeah, man yeah. and then uh and then uh one of the yeah characters. you can find inspiration you know, he did a redesign of Speedy, which yeah. was so much of a, a different look that yeah. you could just rename him Shaft and he became a different character. Yeah. You know, uh, Harlequin became Vogue. Um, yeah. They were just different characters where he was just kind of riffing on what would have been Teen Titans characters. Yeah. And so they ended up being young blood characters instead but but so we we went out to dinner with dave albrecht and, and rob asked him uh would, would you publish a book that i did <laughs> and, then, and uh dave albrecht's like of course, of course i would i publish a book by any of you guys you know so rob being excitable rob was just like oh this will be awesome i'm gonna go this will be great, for you. This will be great. You know, he's just like fired up about. I want to try this out. I'm going to show those guys. No, listen to me. I'm going to show those guys. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to put them together. We're going to do this whole image conference. So um, it's a little too much energy. Yeah, he's he's very much like Rob. Rob has got two modes, and those two modes are. And because <laughs> he he'll just go a mile a minute. And then he hits a wall, and then suddenly it's just out. <laughs> All right. with he, uh, his he did it during the day, but he, he did it in a shorter period of time. The rest oh, of us were up until four in the morning, and Rob's just like out like a light. Um, but so he wanted to to test the waters to see to see yeah. what, what would happen. So he just drew up a drawing of some characters. And he also was curious, like, how come, how come DC isn't doing X books? How come all these other companies aren't doing books with, with X in them? Marvel can't own the, the letter X. How come everybody isn't doing it? So he, he did a book that was like, well, I'm going to do a book called The Executioners. And he put an ad in the Comics Buyer's Guide. Uh, and it was going to come out through Malibu. And it was just a drawing of, of these characters running around. And uh, they took out this ad. And Marvel just lost their minds when they saw oh, shit. Like we're gonna we're gonna sue you. We're gonna blah 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 blah. blah. And and basically, what that was, what got Image going more than anything, was them overreacting, and then Todd or Rob really pushing back, just because he was like, these guys are scared shitless. Of me. These guys yeah. are. Really, we were we frightened them. They're gonna. They think they keep. They know that if we left, they could, bah, 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 you know, and it goes into that whole yeah. discussion on, on what might happen if, if if something like that. And then, you know, when he started talking about that, and then Todd Todd got a wind of it, and it's like, oh, you guys, I didn't know you were going to be doing. <laughs> so, and Todd came up, came aboard, 
And then, uh, you know, once Todd was on there, he became the the active recruiter. He was out there he'd be calling up all these guys. And, and uh, he went to a, a convention in New York and he was like, oh, we got to get we got to get Jim Lee. He's Marvel's golden boy. They love him. What was the, the speech to convince the, the others? It was like, uh, we were going to well, make a revolution. Uh, Once it became, we're gonna we're gonna do these books. You're gonna own your own characters, um, and he beat down on with Malibu on the deal, and the deal was a a ninety ten split. Well, wow. so it was like we would get ninety percent of the <laughs> books that we worked on, and then Malibu would get ten percent. That's like, the first time in history that. that <laughs> So it's like that's a that's a hell of a deal. But uh, I mean, Malibu was also they was they were also getting a, a set amount of money off of every book too. So it was like so it ended up being it was five thousand dollars plus ten percent on every book. Sure. Um, which, if you're selling a lot of comics. Like in that time was a lot yeah, of the time, you know, you're selling a million units or moving yeah. how many it was. I mean, that's that's a lot of comics and that's a lot yeah. of money. And and Malibu at that point, they were just they were doing like black and white comics that were selling, you know, twenty thousand copies mm. and suddenly they're putting out these color comics selling, you know, million four, million five. You know, yeah. or you know, at least hundreds of thousands of copies. Yeah. This was like this is way, way, way bigger and better yeah. than they had ever done before. So this was this was huge for them. Yeah. And that and that just became you know part of the sales pitch is you know if you get ninety percent of the the revenue of these books you're doing, I mean, Marvel's giving you a, a 1.4% of the cover price over a certain amount of copies sold or, or something. And, you know, your anchors are getting 0.6 or something. And your characters are not your... You, you don't know, own, you don't own anything over there. You know, at Marvel DC, if you did a new character, they own it. You know, mm -hmm. here at, at Image, like, we weren't, didn't participate in anybody's mm -hmm. characters at all. We got no uh, participation in terms of, you know, toys or yeah. movies or any kind of licensing that would go yeah, on. We, we got zero on yeah. any of this stuff. And, it, and so it became this super attractive thing to go, oh. Yeah. You know, and, oh, for me, it was like a real revolution around yeah. the time. Was so, like, so part of the sales pitch is even if your book sells a tenth of what it's selling, at Marvel or DC, you're still going to make more money than, than what you're doing right yeah. now. Plus you're yeah. going to have this huge creative freedom and you're going to work with uh, these guys who've been in the business for a little while and have a track record. And also it became the guys who were jumping over were the, the big dogs. So it was, yeah. so it was really like, if I'm jumping over, I'm, Uh, it's it's a prestigious thing. I'm going over with the biggest, best artists in the industry. I want to be jumping in the pool with those guys. That's that sounds like an exciting time to be doing. <laughs> And it was. It was it was a super exciting time for yeah. people to be like. And oh, when you and oh. was hard for you to make the decision to say okay, let's do this. No, no, it wasn't hard at all because uh, at the time. Um, I had just I had just did a short run on Todd's Spider-Man book. I had pitched Marvel on doing um, an ongoing series of Nova, and they came back with, "Well, we're not sure that the character could have an ongoing series, but we'll we'll approve it for a mini series. You can do four issues." So it's like, "Well, I'll, I'll go do I'll go do a mini series of Savage Dragon." first and see how that goes <laughs> it's like oh well, what do you know i paid off my house i guess I'm <laughs> you need to do this you know 
so it, it clear it became pretty obvious really yeah. quick that, that that this was the right move to make. Yeah. As soon no, as for me it, was was it really a, was like holy crap this was this yeah. is huge. No, it was crazy because it was the first time that the table flip. Yeah, because yeah. all the time was the artist that was like, please Marvel, please DC, let me draw for you, let me write for you. But this time was the other other way around. Yeah, yeah. Like, also, you know, guys, what, don't leave, don't leave. Well, okay. the artists in charge of the company, the artists are sitting there looking at, at what, what Marvel's doing and all their comics are on newsprint, with uh, flat color and a very, very limited palette at that. And so we're sitting there going, oh, we can print on better paper and we yeah. can have, you know, great colors like Steve Olaf come in there and just sweeten the hell out of it. Like, yeah, yeah I want that. And so Steve Olaf's crew grew overnight just immediately. And suddenly he's got guys who are in there and he's – compound pound grew suddenly he's got a huge amount of people that are in there steve is frantically doing color guides for everybody and then he started getting other people do color guides for him because it's like i can't keep up with this huge amount of work that I had. and then uh you know so the coloring was this huge revolution in terms of just yeah. visually our books looked so much better than the paper was different also. You know, the paper's better, the printing's better, the coloring is way the hell better. Um, yeah. Suddenly all, all the uh, pages are full bleed, so you can go right to the edge of the printed page. Yeah. It was like everything changed with yeah. these guys. And, it was a real revolution. And they scrambled to keep up. It was like, how do we do this? How can we get our company to, to look this good? And so they're they went after Malibu, like, can we acquire Malibu so that we can just bring in your coloring guys and, and, and absorb all this stuff. You know, meanwhile, Malibu itself, they had been uh, trying to duplicate our success. Like, all right, we're going to do two fronts. We're going to have another creator owned group and we're going to call it Bravura. And then we're going to have uh... another shared universe which we're going to call the ultraverse. Yeah, so, ambition is it, that. So then, yeah. you know, Marvel ended up buying uh, Malibu, and at that point, you know, we had we had split off from them. So it was a year later. We were just like, all right, we're gone. We're going to go do our own thing. We don't need you anymore. And then that was it. Uh, Malibu was uh, absorbed by the Borg, and the rest of us went on and, and continued to do our create our own stuff and self destruct. <laughs> <laughs> self destruct. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, not everybody made their deadlines. Um, suddenly, you had people who were being pulled in 15 different directions. Mm. We had uh, Hollywood agents who were wanting to fly us down and take meetings all the time. And we, we want to do cartoons. We want to do live action. We want to do video games. We want to do all this ancillary crap. And, you know, let's go have a meeting with Toy Biz and let's go have a meeting with all these different companies and all this different stuff. And, and this is all time you're not able to work on your comics, you know? Ah, it's, sure. I, I got to fly someplace. I can't be yeah. drawing while I'm, you know, doing that. And I can't be, you know, I got to be taking meetings with, suddenly you're getting meetings with important people in important places. Like, oh, let's go talk to Judy Price at CBS. And let's go <laughs> talk with, you know, all these, all these different people that you would never have got to be part of anything before. And suddenly you're like, oh, I'm, I'm all over the place. You know, let's, let's do this. And, you know, Nine times out of ten, but, but that, around that time, around that time you have you have like a kind of manage management or you know like for bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we we had agents at a. Uh, I had a, a agent over at uh, CAA who was representing me, and and uh, 
different other people in the group would get different other agents. There wasn't, there wasn't one firm that represented image as okay. a whole because every image creator owned their own rights and owned their own sure. everything. So it was really all over the place. If you were a company and you wanted to do business strictly with image, you couldn't really do that. There wasn't really yeah. a distinct point man um, until we were self-publishing. And, and, and once we had pulled away from Malibu, then it, then it was like, all right, we're going to have a publisher who can kind of be our point man and, and we can filter through some of this nonsense. But, uh, you know, it, it took a while before you got all these pieces in place. Uh, sure. But, you know, I, I, there was a Savage Dragon cartoon that was on, on the air for a couple of years. Yeah. This is the main thing. <laughs> you, know? you, you ever imagine that? That the, the little character you, you draw when you were little? <laughs> No, no, no. We don't think about that. You don't think about that. And, and you know, to this day, you don't. You know, it's like, huh, oh, that was weird that that existed. Um, and now it's on uh, one of those cable TV things. Is is running the old Savage Dragon cartoons now for all the world to see. So, so when you started with Image, you already have some Savage Dragon stories uh, plan or. Well, what I, had, what I had was I had two published stories that I had done in this fanzine called Graphic Fantasy from years ago. Now, when I was a kid, I had drawn all these stories that I'd come up with, but they're, you know, the mentality of a, of a fifth grader. So he, he does not, yeah. doesn't have any sense of the world at all. I just <laughs> have no idea. So by the time I get to 19 years old, the stories that I had done in graphic fantasy were kind of the end of everything that I had done before. So I had built up all these various characters. And then by the time I got to graphic fantasy, it was like, oh, here's the big payoff to this. And then here's the big payoff to that. So those were those two stories that I had done. So when I came about and was doing things at Image, my thought was, well, I'm not going to do the same thing I did as a kid because those comics were terrible and they were, you know, from the, from the point of view of a, of a child. So I can't do that, but I've got this end point that I had worked to. So my, my thought was I'm going to use those, this same end point as my anchor and I'm going to work towards those two stories but I'm gonna start at a different place. I'm gonna start someplace else, work towards those goals. And so those two stories eventually were Savage Dragon 63 and 65. I just redrew those same graphic fantasy stories. Wow. Same basic layout, same basic story, same basic everything. Um, but I started with in a totally different place. Because in, in those stories, Dragon was, a character who had been part of a government run super team called the SOS. And he used to be like the head guy in the SOS. And now he was retired living with his uh, young daughter. But he was like a real guy with a custom or was like a mutant? He, he, he had been a, a, a at that point, he was a superhero. So, and at that point, he was his own guy. By the time I stopped doing the comics as a little kid, he was—he had already become kind of the dragon we know, um, but not quite. <laughs> kind of like mutant. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hell, I've got some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see that. <laughs> uh, we got those. Yeah. That's an impressive collection. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, uh, graphic really fantasy good. one and one and two. There they are, and all their beauty. I mean, they're te they're terrible for the most part, but you can see, like you know, you're looking. Yeah, like, oh, you can recognize the character. I mean, he's got a he's got a fin on his head. It's a short, little, weird looking fin, but it's it's kind of the same. Yeah. Um, 
and then, uh, you know, all the other characters. And this is printed off a tabletop offset press. So all the color is, is misaligned and looks terrible. <laughs> Just because I didn't know. It was, it's a very, very unsophisticated machine, and I could not get the colors to line up for anything. Um, the second cover, I actually drew it in a way that I wow. drew it because I knew that the color couldn't align properly. So it's like I'll put a big bunch of black around it. And so oh, if my right. green shifts this way or that, you know, up, down, left, or right, it's still going to be uh, – yeah, you look pretty good, you know. That's <laughs> so that was the, the whole thought process to doing this the second issue was, I'll have a big bunch of red at the bottom and and you you released that like I, now. I well, I mean, here's my crappy comic from back then. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, <laughs> that will be great to to release a limited run of that just for collectors. <laughs> Well, I, I reprinted both of the stories. One I ran in the back of Savage Dragon uh, 225, and one I ran in the back of Savage Dragon 250. And uh, this, the original stories were in black and white, but I I uh, colored them for the first time. Ah, okay. And I recolored, cool. recolored the covers so they weren't quite so misaligned. Um, so those have been reprinted, and, it, you know, they look – a hundred times better than they ever did in their original print because those look terrible. But you know, that was, so that was my ideas. I'm going to, I'm going to, so I had a, a basic idea of Sorry, this. Okay. Where gonna, oh yeah. There's 250. So, so, I mean, <laughs> and what was the idea that he, he had to be a cop? Well, I knew that eventually he was going to be a, a, a government superhero. So I just kind of backtracked from that and going, well, what could, what could lead to that? What would, what would be a, a logical progression to that? And I had a friend uh, who I went to school with when I was a kid who grew up and he became a police officer. So I knew him. And so I, sort of had some familiarity with with police and police stuff and I thought just as a as a logical uh, progression like okay being a being a cop could lead to you know, you've got experience doing this and then that could lead to maybe oh we want to do a government team who could we have head this government team well there's this guy who's you know is is used to working with with uh, higher ups and he's used to doing, doing this. And, and, and it just became something that seemed like it would be a logical stepping stone towards becoming a government super, super guy, you know? Yeah. So that was the thought process there. Um, it, it wasn't a particular like, Oh, I love the police. I got it. <laughs> it was, it was really, um, this just seems like it could be where I'm going. And, and really, uh, that was the, that was the whole thought, thought process. So, so for me, you know, I've got people who are going, Oh, I love the iconic dragon as a cop story. And I'm sitting, there going, you know, they, whenever they think of dragon, they're like, I think of him as being a police officer. When is he going to become a police officer again? And in my own head, I'm thinking, Never. <laughs> He's a superhero dude. He's always been a superhero guy in my mind. Mm. The cop yeah. was just this. No, but for me, the contrast was great. The contrast <laughs> was great because uh, you you can never imagine, uh, you know, a police guy like like that. So, no, it just was it just, really original. The concept, the drawing, and you know this kind of. This style, you know, the lines, you know, <laughs> where, where do you get that? <laughs> you just, it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it all just, it's just all your, you, the have, very you have some kind of inspiration of, uh, there's an artist that, that inspire you. 
It's it's various guys. It's it's all the stuff that you grew up like, with. Like you know? uh I don't it, know. It's Walt Jack Kirby. Frank, it's Jack Kirby, it's Frank Miller, it's uh John Byrne. Um yeah. when I was a real little kid, I was super into uh Herb Trimpey, who was doing the Hulk at, at the time, and I had really gotten into that book. And yeah. so it was like all these guys and everybody's style is just kind of as amalgamation of, of everything they loved. It's like, Oh, this guy's doing this cool thing. I gotta, I gotta start incorporating that. Um, a bunch of us got really into, uh, Michael Golden for a while. It's just like, he, he did a couple of things that everybody's like, Oh my God, I can't believe And you did. learn everything by yourself. You're self taught. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's all not reading a million comics. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I mean, I took I took art classes as much as I could when I was in high school. There was actually a, a teacher who taught a cartooning class uh, when I was going to school in Mendocino. It was just an after school thing. It was like, oh, this guy's teaching our cartooning class. I should take that. And um, yeah, he was terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, for, me, for me, it's the same. I love music, but the first time I they teach me to play a guitar when I was a little kid was with some crappy songs. So yeah. I hate the guitar. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know? but it's the, a lot of it. Then, you, then I learned it by myself playing the, the songs I like, and then, then it, it was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so. think that, that's hard. <laughs> So, so mostly it was just hitting the books, you know, buying whatever art books you could on, on anatomy and perspective and, you know, how to draw comics the Marvel way was a huge one because you're just like, I didn't even know what size paper I'm supposed to be drawing this on. Yeah. You know, getting a hold of some actual original art was a huge eye opener. Like, oh, it's drawn this big and oh, it looks like this. And when But things yeah. break down suddenly, you know, I know what that looks like. But I think that maybe right now, there are people that don't know that when you you draw a comic like this, you have to do it. Uh, hey, you draw way bigger. And sometimes yeah. you draw super big, depending on how, uh, um, how I you think you, you have some of those behind your back. Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> yeah, a few. <laughs> All right, I'll be off camera here for, I mean, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And you keep all, 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 all those, and it's very well organized, <laughs> I, I well, might this, say. This is all, this is all Savage Dragon when it was regular size. And then this, this is more, more modern, so. Wow. That's yeah. So this is big. some of this is crazy big. <laughs> let me let me get some. Yeah, no. The first time I I knew that I it just blew my mind. But then it makes sense because you can add more details. You know. Yeah, yeah you can do all sorts of stuff. You know, um, and and yeah. Yeah, I can. I have some Spider-Man stuff up here. And you're still drawing no, on paper, or yeah, you yeah. move a little to yeah. digital? You you try uh, a little digital. There's a little bit. Of, I mean, yeah. Here's a here's this here's Spider-Man cover. Wow. <laughs> But this is this is this is huge. This is gigantic, you know. Yeah. We, we actually, look at it next to a human being. Like, yeah, that's how big that is. Where I, when I was drawing, you know, so <laughs> this, this, this is the this is the standard size right here. Yeah, and why why that one was so big? There was a particular uh, reason. It was. I started at, at one point. I just, I just was like, I wanted to see what it would feel like to um, work twice up because that was the old standard size would be twice the size of the printed page. 
Okay. And um, that's like a a four. A um, actually, this is it's. Hang on, this is a. Try to reach into the pile, Eric. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm off screen. But... Don't worry. This is um, part of history. <laughs> uh, keep, I keep finding issues that are drawn in weird ways. So. And sometimes you you make those for sale or or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've sold a bunch of stuff. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that yeah. would pay good money for that. Yeah. So basically, what happened is, see, modern comics bleed, right? So they the artwork yeah. the artwork extends to the edge of the of the printed page. So, yeah. so basically, what I did I is I can I can do I made my uh, own paper. I will give you the just give me. A, <laughs> there right. you go. You have there. the whole camera for you. So basically, this this interior box here is the old twice up size, but because art bleeds now, it can extend to the to the edge of the printed page. Um, what I did is I I added this extra box around it so that if I wanted right. to, if I need you know if I needed to have something extend, yeah. I could. Extend it, right? Ah, okay. So then, then that page would it will be that, more that So this would go all the way out to the to the edge of the yeah. printed page of the of the comic book. Yeah, the effect is. Whereas these panels at the bottom, you know, would still be choked in. They yeah. Be more size. It had so more it in, more impact. <laughs> it had yeah. a little bit more more impact, more visual impact yeah. when you do that. And so and I started doing covers that way. So like wow. this, this cover is like, you know, drawn huge. And yeah, this another, that's this, beautiful. There's another Savage Dragon cover here, which is, wow. you know, gigantic. And then you, you do it backwards. You you kind of is. What is that? All, all, all is black. So you have to do it like in reverse. Uh, like you, <laughs> kind of. Kind of. I mean, it, yeah, you, you you figure you figure out a way. <laughs> wow, no, that's crazy. I'm I'm really thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> Why all that behind the scenes stuff? And yeah, that happened when when I started when I moved to doing um, artwork that wasn't lettered on the boards. When it was lettered on the physical artwork, like back back in the old days. Everything would be, you know, all the lettering would be on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when there's sound effects and whatever else, it would all be on the physical artwork. Um, yeah. but, but when we moved to doing digital, it became well. I can, I don't have to draw this any particular size. I don't have to draw it any one size at all. I could draw pages that are tiny if I wanted to, and mm -hmm. since the lettering is going to be done on on the computer. Lettering can still be as tight and as nice as as it was, it, no matter what size I'm drawing it. So I can I did an issue where I drew it really small too, and then I've done a bunch of issues where I'm drawing them, what I call twice up, which is twice up plus bleed. Uh, and so it's like I I can do anything. I can do it any any size I want to, and uh, and then I have, and that's been like. Let, let's try it out for this issue. See how the, you like it. Try it out a different way for a different issue. See how you like that. And it can it can change a lot uh, from from month to month and issue to issue, depending on what it is. You know, because yeah. there's some months that I'm sitting there going, I want to do an issue that's all double page spreads. All right, how are you gonna how are you gonna do that? You know, you sit there and you figure out, all right, I'm going to draw the pages this size and they're going to be like this and, and stuff like that. I mean, and as big as these are, I was doing twice up um, double page spreads on single sheets. 
And those things are just crazy big. <laughs> yeah. No, but this, that's All great right. because you can, you can add way more detail and yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Because when, well, I'm still a comic book fan, but before I was thinking that the, the guys were drawing at the size of the comic. So when I saw the first time, the, the other side were like, what? <laughs> Making a mess back here. All right. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, see this. This issue. All right. You ready? Yeah. So this. Wow. Is that? It's crazy. So, I mean, you, you said. <laughs> Wait, I will. You can sort of. Just like. When it, it's like here here's the size of that cover you just saw earlier wow yeah you know, and the, ah, we'll get there, 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 like, what that. what size is that it's like um gigantic, <laughs> gigantic. <laughs> i don't even yeah it it's like this, a is, this is the kind of size where you have to go to the art store and buy those single sheets because they're yeah. so they're so good and big um <laughs> the other paper i can actually get I can get these these pads, so I can I can get these. Yeah, I mean, it's like I'm advertising them in the background. Now. <laughs> but you know, these these Bristol pads wow. are uh, yeah, whatever it is, 19 by 24 inches. All and right. so, so this is the size where I could do all the all the full pages and and covers that way. But uh, you know, unless I'm going to do the double page spread smaller, then I can't really, you know, I can't do it. Do it on these sheets. Um, I actually started doing pages a little bit smaller more recently because this twice up stuff is such a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure of that. And you ever try to work? Uh, with tablet or digital stuff? Uh, a little bit. And there's some effects that I do digitally, because um, a lot of times they'll be like, "Oh, I want characters to wear certain shirts or whatever." Mm. So I'll just be like, "All right, well, I can make that shirt in a uh, digitally, and then I'm gonna I can just pull that onto the character so that he's wearing the same shirt from panel to panel, and not have to sure. not have to worry about it, you know." But you're not you're not a big fan. Um, I just never got the comfort with it that, uh, sure. that I like, you know? Yeah, no, for me, it's kind of, you know, really, it's so, so different because uh, the touch, you know, you can, mm -hmm. you can, you can feel the touch of the paper, the pressure, yeah. the pressure, the, and then, and then there's a lot of happy accidents and, uh, yeah. And then, and then things where you, where you, where you're like, oh, I got I, now I have to compensate for this terrible thing I did, um, <laughs> you know. And and there's when you can just press a button and undo, that's a that's a really different process from when you're sitting there working on physical stuff and suddenly, yeah. it's like, oh, I screwed this up and it's it, it screwed up for good. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Undo. You, you know. can you can yeah. make so, control C uh, yeah so I, to, like I gotta find a way to fix this and yeah. you know you you find whatever ways you can to to kind of compensate for whatever yeah <laughs> that you just did you know? maybe so, the lines was a yeah, more nobody will notice once you put in more lines yeah. <laughs> that was great so Eric Larson. Um, whether you have any plans for Savage Dragon, whether you're working at the moment, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I mean, my plan is to do it. The, the Savage Dragon Ooh. fighting COVID. <laughs> yeah. I, I am doing some of the, some COVID stuff in the book, but it's not something you can punch, you know. Sure. I'm definitely doing. I did an issue where characters are 
are sheltered at home. And it's like, we got to go out, we got to wear a mask and we got to do this and that. Yeah. Um, Malcolm Dragon's kids are starting uh, grammar school. They're starting kindergarten. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they have to deal with all this stuff. Like how are, how are schools going to be yeah. at that point and where are things at? So I need to do some research, actually, <laughs> on on what goes on there. Yeah, sure. So, how are things? Uh, out in, you live in San Francisco, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so how how are things there? Uh we've been we've been sheltering at home. Very very. Uh, very much very hardcore sheltering at home stuff going on here so okay. i've been spending you know i mean it's not that different because i work at home anyway so so yeah, it's not yeah. like it's like so radically departure from everything else that i've done before but it's like you know right now instead of being able to go out and draw at a coffee shop once a week now you got to draw at home every day yeah of course well eric i know you're a busy guy we already spent one almost one hour and a half oh, i can thank i can thank you enough you share some amazing stories some great <laughs> impressions of tom Nactalin <laughs> and rob Lito. All right. you, you have some others you can make <laughs> a Rita junior <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, mystery, uh. <laughs> I, I, I haven't. Some of those guys I haven't talked with as much as I have Todd. So really, you you still stay in touch with uh, I don't know with some of the I don't know with uh, yeah no various guys depending on who on who they are and what's going on. I mean, some of it's just you know if you've got something yeah. to say. Most of us are sitting there working at home at this point, so you know. Yeah, of course. What's going on with you? Same as you. I'm sitting here alone. <laughs> uh, like, all yeah. right. We're tapped for conversation immediately since you know all my backstory. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, every now and then I'll, I'll get calls from, from Robert Kirkman. He's just like, you know, hey, what's going on? How's it going? <laughs> 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 And, and and talking to him about you know whatever is going on with him and whatever's going on with me and so there'll be, there'll be some so I'll talk to Robert I'll talk to Rob Lightfoot on occasion I'll talk to Todd on occasion yeah um uh Chris so the crazy Altman. story of Rob Lightfoot it was <laughs> I get you, you saw this story well like one guy that was wish that yeah was, whatever. Yeah, like, people are always people are always being shitty on the internet. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a, a it's so easy. It's so easy to just spell crap on internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Rob sort of is ending up being this kind of internet punching bag for for a lot of people that they see him as this guy whose success was undeserved. I think what you know because they go. Really? Oh, You know, oh, he can't draw, and he's and he's he can draw. Are you kidding? Oh, he's me? terrible. He can't draw, and he's 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 got way more success than he should. There's all these other artists who draw way better, and they uh, should be more popular. No, for me, bro, life but it really changed the um, the his style was so unique <laughs> that when he made Cyber Force and everything. He he really was. The result was so unique. Even if, there's a lot of people that say, "Well, the proportion are not real." But <laughs> fuck you, it's a comic book. <laughs> We don't give a fuck about proportion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's that's part of it. It's just like yeah, you know, it. It, if it you it. if you thought yeah. I was trying to draw realistic and failing miserably, well, you're wrong. Well, I wasn't trying to do that. You know. Yeah, don't, of course. Don't, I'm based me for, for if you want something you know, realistic, you go to another, another artist, but no, no, real life it was really like something like 
so like the impression that you were doing like oh with something with a lot of energy uh, so yeah i i don't understand that but well it's internet so. it's the internet in general the internet yeah. just leads yeah, to people being being shitty to one another because you can't yeah. you know there's yeah. no repercussions for any of this yeah it's you are not saying that face to face. <laughs> you know in a room with with Rob Liefeld or in a room with anybody, you just start talking about the stuff that interests you and you're excited about talking about it. Very few yeah. people in, in the real world would go up to any comic book creator and just pitch them crap for, yeah. it's, it's, why would I do that? It's just, I, I would just be rude. Yeah. What do I get out of it? You know, there's plenty of, of, of creators whose work I'm not especially fond of, but, there, there'd be no point whatsoever in me picking a fight with them, or, yeah. or you know, or ridiculing their work in a, in any kind of a public forum. Mm. So it's like you, you get nothing from it, and you, yeah. all you're going to do is you're going to divide the audience and have people choosing sides. Sure. As a creator. So as a creator, there's very little criticism that you mm. can dish out without getting yourself in, in hot water, you know? Yeah. And before before we finish, I promise it's the last question, <laughs> because I know you have some okay. comic to grow. Um, yeah. I'm kind of very curious about the that issue that you draw with Trump. Hmm? <laughs> Why? Where, well, where, where I mean, I, came from? I've drawn issues with... Uh, with Obama and I had drawn issues with other and and kind of it was more about uh, the toxic the the toxic kind of behavior that he uh, encourages and and that, that kind of comes about from him encouraging people yeah uh, and so if you actually read that story. Um, Donald Trump is hardly in it at all, and he doesn't have any dialogue at all. Um, it's really just uh, his supporters being toxic, yeah. and most of most of the dialogue that is in that particular story um, from Trump supporters, almost all of it is taken verbatim from Trump supporters. I went on. Uh, uh, I went on Facebook sites and I went on uh, various other threads online and just was, I was just pulling quotes left and right yeah, and was using that as, as lines of dialogue from, from various people in there. In fact, uh, some of the um, people who show up in the story as Trump supporters were photo reference Trump supporters from just online, just finding people and just going, oh, I like this guy's face. I'm going to use him as a as a, a person who's on TV or a person who's talking or whatever. Mm. So it's 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 very referenced in, in terms of you know when yeah. I'm drawing Donald Trump, I'm not I'm not doing a caricature of Donald Trump. No. I'm I'm that's from photographs and it's yeah. like, is a photograph of his face, and I'm I'm tracing this off and then turning it into line work because it's a drawing. Mm. Um, but the the couple times that I draw him in the book, they've been the, mm. those are photographs that I and I'm drawing on top of. And you receive a little backlash for a that? Bit, a little bit, not a lot, not a lot. Okay. I mean, most most people I think can can look at look at the story and read a story and go, okay, that's from a point of view. I might not necessarily agree with it, but uh, I realize that it's fiction. There are people yeah. around with green skin and fins on yeah. that. No, because I think, uh, especially these days, you have to have a lot of courage to take a position or an opinion. Yeah. Because uh, I think, in especially these days in the United States, is uh, kind of a split in two sides. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Very much. Yeah. Very, much very much two different sides. So 
for the most part, um, I think it's, you know, for the most part I've avoided it. I haven't had, I haven't invoked Trump's name very much. In fact, yeah. I have, uh, I had my characters move to Canada specifically so I wouldn't have to. <laughs> so I wouldn't to have deal to with it. That. Yeah, of course. I'm going to say this in Toronto. It's not going to be the world that we're used to. Just yeah. so I can, you know, I don't want to deal with politics month in, month out. It just gets boring. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because always people pick sides and it's hard to make, to have a real conversation. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, I'd rather tell stories about other stuff and I've got enough other stuff going on that, yeah. it's like, you know, I'll say my piece, but, you know, moving on from there, I'm going yeah. go and, and tell these other stories. Yeah. No, but that's great. But at least you, you have the the balls to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I really by that point I had already I had already had George Bush be in the book and I already had a, um Clinton was in an earlier issue. And then <laughs> I, it's like I got Clinton, I got Bush, I've got uh, everyone. I've got Obama in here. It's like yeah. Trump oh, supporter. Okay. Like I got I got it gotta have him you know and if there's if we have another if we ever have another fair election and, and get <laughs> president, you know yeah. probably well, include the next president you know who will be who knows <laughs> yeah well, so no i really i re sorry <laughs> cross your fingers <laughs> hope for the best um i really thank you for your time this uh, this was a really amazing conversation your thank for share all your art and with, for me your 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 story is amazing how how this character you you draw when you were a little kid and now is uh, is you know uh, all around yeah. the world you know you update stuff but a lot of the a lot of the characters who were in the book, especially early on, were just characters that were from my old comics when I was a when I was a wee lad. You know, it's like yeah, that was uh, great. And and you know you you update them and you change things a little bit because yeah, like, right. You know, Bronze Man. That's not such a cool name. Let's oh, and you're so such an inspiration for every creator, every musician, <laughs> artist. Because you 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 have an idea what you wanted to do, you believe in your art, you you I don't know was um, was great, but <laughs> because I I'm sure there was a lot of time that maybe some people were saying yeah, but Eric come on uh, find a real job or something like that, <laughs> and you you stick to your dream and yeah. voila. <laughs> I've never actually had a real job. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't know. The people say that to artists, mm -hmm. they don't realize that it's actually hard work to create something. Yeah. I have uh, original ideas and be, you know, have a deadline. Uh, but I don't know. Just artists can understand that. So I really thank you for your time and. Mm -hmm. I wish you the best. Uh, stay safe. All right. We'll do it. You too. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, maybe I will have you another time. I don't know, oh. but keep the good work with the Savage Dragon. Will do. I'll keep uh, going. Yeah. <laughs>